Hello, everyone, and welcome to the webinar today. The webinar will run one hour today. This means that you must be present for 54 minutes of this 60-minute webinar in order to qualify for continuing education credit. Please stay on for the live question and answer session at the end of to ensure you meet the time requirements. And this is a disclaimer that we have to put required by our lawyers. Uh, this webinar is intended to provide general information only and does not con constitute professional or engineering advice. No participant or user should act on the basis of any material contained in the webinar without obtaining proper professional advice specific to their situation. Further, the views expressed by speakers or other third parties are those of the speaker or third party and not necessarily of AWC. And then it goes on regarding the warranty of non-warranty of, of what's presented. This is included in your handout. Lastly, please note that this webinar is being recorded and by remaining a participant, you automatically consent to such recordings. If you do not consent to being recorded, please disconnect from the session. And now, thank you for staying with us through all of those housekeeping slides. I'm gonna hand it off to Lori to introduce our guest speaker. And while we're doing that, um, I'm gonna launch a poll to the first poll, one and only poll regarding your profession. Okay. I'll close the poll because we have about 82% and then I'll share it. And we have 8% architects, 55% engineers, 29% code officials, 2% fire service, and 6% building manufacturer and other. Well, thank you everyone for joining us. We appreciate you being with us. And then I'm going to have Lori, now take over from here. All right. Thank you, Michelle. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, this is our deck panel discussion. My name is Lori Cook. I'll be your moderator. Our panelists today include Matt Hunter and Lauren Ross from the AWC and our special guest, Mike Gurton. We have our necessary copyright information. And this program is accredited by AIA and ICC. So those of you who are uh, interested in continuing education credit, we are offering it. I'm going to assume everybody read the course description when they registered for this course, so I won't spend a whole lot of time, but this is a new format that we're trying today, so and we wanna thank everybody for participating. We're gonna spend uh, just about maybe 20 minutes uh, with our panelists pr presenting some prepared remarks, and then we're gonna spend the rest of the time with engaging with you all uh, with some questions that folks had submitted previously. And if you have other questions that come up during the, the session, please feel free to type those in the question box and we'll try to get to as many as we can. Obviously with such a large crowd, we might not be able to get to every question, but we'll try to do the best we can. Our learning objectives were also uh, available when you, when you all registered, so we won't spend too much time on those. And as Michelle said, we have our disclaimer required by our lawyers, uh, so we are recording this. So our first presenter is Matt Hunter, and Matt, I'm going to go ahead and give you control of the screen, and Matt's going to speak to us about fasteners. 
Thank you so much for the introduction, uh, Laurie and Michelle, and uh, good afternoon or good morning uh, to our West Coast attendees. Uh, hopefully you can see my lovely picture up there because I'm not going to share my webcam, webcam this afternoon. So I just want to talk to you uh, a little bit about um, some components of a deck today, and we're going to have a focus on fasteners. And <clears throat> The first slide um, is from a, a noted uh, deck professional and researcher, uh, Frank Wiesty. Uh, he does a lot of uh, testing and research on wood, wood decks, and he did a lot of this at, uh, while he was with the professor at Virginia Tech. And you can see the, um, the quote from him. And it's basically saying that very, very few instances or hardly any uh, times uh, decks have collapsed because of overloading. overloading. Um, more, more frequent, more current, uh, issues happen to be with lack of maintenance, decay, uh, and corrosion of fasteners. So in his professional uh, practice, he's not aware of any deck or guide rail, uh, guardrail failures where the deck had been inspected and repaired uh, on an annual basis. So it's, it's critical uh, for safety. So the, the fasteners themselves uh, and the inspection and the maintenance of the structure uh, for it to be a permanent structure for any length of time is, is critical. So when we start looking uh, about looking at decks in the building code, uh, we have references uh, in the IRC um, in chapter three, uh, and these are the minimums. So um, the the picture on the on the right that you see in the slide uh, was of a carriage bolt, a half inch diameter carriage bolt uh, that was removed after about 13 years uh, from a guard post in uh, North Carolina. So corrosion is is definitely a problem uh, based upon the uh, size and condition of this particular fastener, I would think that the wood preservative treatment uh, was a factor because you can see the uh, the head of the carriage bolt really isn't uh, too much more than the original uh, installed carriage bolt, but the length and diameter of the fastener shrank considerably. So there's a, a ton of factors that might uh, impact the longevity and durability of your fasteners and, and connectors uh, associated with a deck that's installed in a wet service condition. And just remember that the corrosion um, listings in the IRC uh, are the are the minimums minimum acceptable performance standards for corrosion. Uh, so uh, decks are not really not permanent structures without ongoing maintenance and repair. Uh, there are lots of warning signs, uh, and the the usual suspect locations uh, are well known and well documented with with decks. When we start attaching uh, structural ledgers to the house, we want to make sure our bulk water details. Uh, are, are very robust and uh, to the best practices we can do and also, of course, code compliant. Uh, you can see in the picture on the, on the lower part of the slide there, uh, definitely some bulk water issues. Uh, you know, part of the ledger is, is still appears to be in good condition while other parts are just completely uh, just gone. So pay attention to bulk water uh, and flashing details. Are, are these are critical components uh, when we're looking at a deck, uh, deck fastening and deck connectors. So um, some questions are, 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 deck, are yearly inspections warranted uh, for wood decks? A lot of homeowners associations mandate uh, annual, insp annual safety, safety inspections on wood decks. Uh, for those of you in the audience uh, that either are inspecting decks or building wood decks, have you removed any fasteners from a deck you've constructed and, and looked at those or inspected those? Uh, the photo in the upper right, what does this tell you about <clears throat> the maintenance that was performed or the lack of maintenance that was performed on the deck? What does it show you about the patterns of corrosion? Uh, the photos in the bottom right with the penetration of the lag screw into the interior rim board of the house uh, and the uh, machine bolt and washer, they're starting to turn white and they're starting to get frosty. That means the uh, sacrificial zinc corrosion uh, is starting to approach the limit of its service life. So these are things, these are things we wanna look out for. Some useful resources for you, uh, specifically for code officials that are uh, along the coast, or even in some cases inland from the coast, uh, is the National Atmospheric Deposition Program. Uh, these, these, uh, this data and all the, the numbers that you see uh, on the map of the United States there, those are the actual uh, testing station locations uh, that are you know, installed throughout the country. Uh, and you can see the propensity for the bright red along the coast, uh, and this was just data for uh, sodium ion wet deposition in 2018. 
uh, and the the volume is in kilogram, or I should say that, that the amount is in uh, kilograms uh, per square hectare uh, of additional uh, sodium ion de deposition associated uh, with proximity to the coast. Take a note, take a, just look how far it feeds uh, into the Gulf Coast area in Louisiana and Texas. So, so that the effects of um, corrosion and, and salt laden air moving from the coast are, are significant. And this is again from 2018. If we go to the next slide, I'm getting a little bit of a lag, so I apologize. Still getting some lag. Oh, it jumped. I have to go back. My apologies. Little little technical difficulties here. Lori, could you go to the previous slide? Well. <laughs> Yeah. Right. I thought there was one more okay. map slide. My apologies. Oh my god. Oh my gosh. Another podcast. Uh, your mic's your mic's still on. It's okay. But pay but pay attention in the in the coastal areas if you're a code official and you're seeing lots of wood decks uh, constructed in your uh, jurisdiction. Okay, so who's typing? Could you please mute everybody, Lily? Uh, so for some considerations when you consider uh, fasteners and hardware. Uh, when you're looking at a deck, what type of wood treatment are you using? What, what is the preservative treatment that you're using? Uh, for those preservative uh, treatments, what type of uh, corrosivity uh, do the compounds for the preservative treatment um, have an effect on the fasteners that you're using? When you're looking at fasteners uh, and the, the resiliency of the fasteners or the durability of the fasteners, what or what type of fasteners are you using in what locations? Are they ledger or lag screws, or are they merely securing the deck boards uh, down on top of the deck? If we're installing uh, any particular type of life safety fasteners, you know, critical fasteners in critical locations, uh, when we install these, how difficult would it be to uh, inspect those fasteners? Or if we had to replace those uh, fasteners or repair them, how difficult would it be? We want to look at the initial cost of the fastener versus uh, a more robust uh, corrosion resistance on the fastener, and then also what do the manufacturers uh, indicate uh, we should do for those particular uh, materials installed uh, in a wet service location, such as for a wood deck. Okay, so when we talk about um, the, the fastener policy for the AWC, we specify best engineering guidance. So the DCA6 that hopefully many of you are familiar with, the design for code acceptance six, um, refers to best engineering practice uh, when it's not lining up uh, with the international residential code. So our policy is to match the performance criteria of the fastener uh, based upon the expected service life of the materials and the, the fastener or connector that's being used. For hot dip galvanized materials, what is the expected service life of the structure you're creating? Uh, what are what are the atmospheric or geographic impacts that are associated with your particular project location? Uh, and what is the sacrificial uh, decay rate of the protective coating that's protective near, protecting your fasteners? So when we look at sacrificial uh, components like uh, zinc, zinc coatings, uh, those by definition are um, sacrificial coatings. They're, they're not uh, inert materials. They go from uh, cathodic to anodic on the scale. Uh, 316 uh, stainless steel series uh, stainless steels are highly corrosion resistant even in maritime uh, installations or even in coastal installations. There are other materials that the DCA6 uh, calls out and there are other references uh, in references in the code to corrosion resistant materials such as silicon bronze, copper or other proprietary materials but they might not be obtainable in your area and uh, cost might also be a factor. So the last two slides I have, 
if I can get it to advance, are on the thickness coatings um, as specified by, by ASTM for galvanized hardware. Uh, and this particular ASTM table is showing you the thickness uh, of galvanized coatings after fabrication. So for example, if we're creating a joist hanger um, in, the, in, the, in the plant, we're not gonna coat it with uh, galvanized protection until we're done bending, shaping it, drilling it, punching it. So this particular table shows you the minimum coatings uh, on top of the, uh, the bare metal or the ferrous material uh, that the zinc, zinc uh, galvanizing is gonna be in terms of its overall thickness. Uh, and the table, the ASTM coating grade on the, on the table, on the column on the far left, uh, lines up very, very nicely with the micron table, which is the second column uh, from the right. So for some, for some reference materials, uh, a 30 seconds of an inch would be about 793 microns. Uh, a 64th of an inch would be about 396 microns. And for reference, uh, the human hair is, human hair is approximately four thousandths of an inch thick. So uh, in terms of four thousandths of an inch thick, that would be in mils. So uh, if we had an ASTM coating grade of 100, that would be approximately four thousandths of an inch thick of galvanized uh, coating protection on a fastener. And the last slide I have uh, is the ASTM uh, schedule fastener sch or coating schedule for um, screws and fasteners, uh, either smaller than three eighths of an inch or larger than three eighths of an inch. And you can see the averages there. And the the items in parentheses are microns, and the other uh, tabular values are in mils or there are thousands, thousands of an inch. So you can see the numbers are pretty small. And again, the code references uh, the absolute minimum for corrosion protection. So those are all the slides I have. I wanna turn it over to Lori to get our next uh, panelist. Awesome, thank you, Matt. That was very informative. And we're gonna next go to Lauren Ross, if we can get our technology to cooperate with us. So Lauren, uh, let's see. Oh, you, hang on a second. Yeah, oh, I don't think you meant hang. to have my screen be showing. <laughs> Whoops, yeah, let's see. Let's try that again. Give, give you the mouse and keyboard. Okay. 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 Okay, so what I've been asked to do is to talk a little bit about what's coming up in the next version of the IRC. Um, these are the proposals, some of the some of the significant proposals that passed relating to DEX. And uh, the when it says like RB184, that's the proposal number. If you want to go onto ICC's website and look it up and have more information about that. So these are the some of the bigger ones. Um, and I was involved with several of these, but not all of them, but we'll we'll go through and talk about them. Let's see, feeling that lag that Matt was talking about. Okay, so the snow loading. We were asked by uh, the Structural Engineers Association if we could add snow loads to DEX. Current, uh, previous to the, the 2021 IRC, it just basically said, hey, look, we have a 40 PSF snow load or live load. And if your snow load is less than that, then you're good. And it didn't really say anything if you have 50, 60, 70 um, ground snow load. So we added, added those tables. And as you'd expect, it's a lot of large tables to make that happen because it's, you know, going from 40 to 40, 50, 60, and 70. So it's quadrupling the number of tables. Um, we also had to kind of change how things were organized. They're now based on tributary area. I believe the footings were based on tributary area in the, before, but now it's also the posts. The joist for allowable joist span is also slightly changed. It used to be, this is the third significant um, format change to that table. It used to be have values if you have no overhang and spans if you have overhangs, and then it changed to um, 
it changed to spans that you're allowed to have and overhangs that you're allowed to have based on the spacing of the joists. And we were looking at it and we said, hey, look, it's the allowed overhang is more dependent upon the actual normal joist, the main span, than it is the spacing of the joist. So we changed that. Um, unfortunately, the four by beams were neglected. So like your four by 12 or whatever, but you can use, you can safely use a two two by and it works out the same. The footing and frost protection, I wasn't really involved with this one, but I like this one quite a bit. Um, it clarifies what needs to have frost protection and what doesn't. Like if you're, there's no point in having a deck that has frost protection if it's connected to a building that doesn't have frost protection, right? It's it it makes it more parallel with what with what you're going what you're doing, um, with the idea of that you don't want you don't want the change in uh, shifting um, from from the frost heave uh, to cause damage. Okay. Let's see. Oh yeah, this one is another one that I wasn't really involved with. Um, it's that. Uh, the beams for your decks are now supposed to be directly attached. They have a figure somewhat similar to this that uh, says, "Hey, look! If you're if you're separating them, your the idea is that you're not giving equal amount of loads. They're not acting as a unit, and and they're not going to have equal amount of loads on them." Um, I haven't seen any testing or anything like that to really show that this is the problem, but that is what apparently enough people have have been concerned about it that they felt like the code change was appropriate. Deck beam overhangs. In all, this is kind of a, a unique one too, in that the all the previous tables and things, they assumed a full overhang on your joists and your beams. And the reason they did that is because it was a conservative thing. If you didn't have the overhang, then you didn't have as much load on the post or the beam or whatever it was. And so it was always assuming a full overhang, which meant that everything was almost always slightly oversized because, because most people have an overhang, but it's not necessarily a quarter of the main span or whatever it may be. And so this, this kind of workaround was created. And I think it's fairly unique in the IRC. Usually what you do in the IRC is you you look up and you get your number like seven foot seven or whatever it may be, and then you multiply it by a factor and that's what you you get. This one, you you go into it with the multiplied factor. So like if I have 12 foot joist spans, but my, but my overhang is only um, a sixth, I multiply that 12 by that 0.9 and go in with the lesser value. So it's it's a it's a it's a pre-processing instead of a post-processing of the value. And I think that's fairly unique, but it's a it's fairly clever how how that's done. The decking, the actual decking spans itself were kind of clarified. Um, previous to this, it was kind of always showing like a multi-span, which doesn't really make sense um like if especially if you're doing like a diagonal decking there's going to be times when you just can't have it do a multi-span can't have it have bearing on three supports right in the corners and whatnot or if you're doing um a small landing or something like that it you might not have the multi-span so this was added um added to it and the the five quarters and the two inch were also separated out And this one is also kind of a fun one. Um, this one was was has been a big push by the organization that did most of the deck proposals called the Deck Code Coalition, and they have been pushing that there's a difference between handrails and guards. Guards are to to prevent falling from one elevation to another, where handrails are to provide stability so you don't fall like upstairs or whatnot. And so the code, the IRC, for the longest time had treated them exactly the same, that you, they have to resist load in any direction. So the idea for a guard is that you would it would prevent you from falling into the deck instead of off the deck. 
and they were able to pass this to get it clarified so that it's not um, that if it is truly just a guard, you don't have to do an inward an inward or downward force. And that's my part of the presentation. So, so great. Hand it back to Lori. Thank you, Lauren. All right. And last but not least, we're going to wrap things up with Mike Gurton, our special guest. And Mike is going to talk about some additional resources and some general things that might not fit uh, in other parts of the presentation. So go ahead, Mike, and take it away. Okay, we'll see if the screen responds. And well, I'm going to start talking and it's not advancing, so we'll see if it just I'll, I'll picks up. advance it for you if it doesn't. Here we go. So the most decks, now I don't have any research to support this um, proposition, but I would, uh, my guess from my experience and talking both the building officials and contractors around the country is that most decks are designed by the builder or that and that builder might be a professional it might even be a homeowner um and the yeah most of the folks that are on this call are engineers and architects as i noted when we did the poll earlier so you all have opportunities because of your uh education and skills at being able to do all the calculations that us mere mortal builders and homeowners don't have um, we pretty much rely on prescriptive measures to design and build decks which is really handy um, and i just want to talk about some of my go-to uh, different resources so we can advance one slide um, these same resources are also good for um for or building officials. A lot of building officials and inspectors aren't engineers either, so they need something to lean on when they're going to be, uh, you know, evaluating a deck for uh, at the plan review stage. So first off, uh, everybody, well, I hope everybody's familiar with it. If you're not, you can get this at the American Wood Council's website is DCA6. It's a, it's got a lot more information and prescriptive measures that uh, are parallel with the code and go into detail that the code doesn't. So it makes it a lot easier for us to just pick this up and it's basically, it's a handbook to build a deck. Um, some of the features that are in DCA6 get overlooked by a lot of both code officials and deck builders. And those are things that are way in the back in the appendixes. Uh, one of those is uh, the, um, the, the, the requirements for or the area requirements for when we when we're in hazardous area on a deck like along stairways and at landings where we need to have safety glazing or guards in front of glazing so that's that illustration on the bottom left another thing is the uh, the footing size table that's in uh, it's called b3 and it's in the in the appendix there this it goes into a lot more detail than the uh, table uh, four that's in the front part of the DCA6, and it gets into the different uh, soil bearing capacities as well as tributary areas so that you can really zoom in on the size of the footing that we would need depending on the conditions, you know, beam or the span between the posts that are supporting a beam uh, that's supporting the joists above and the, and the soil capacities. Another, de another uh, resource that's real handy is the code book. Now, a lot of contractors, when they hear, oh, the code book and the code sections, they just kind of shy away from those. But what I found in the, the deck code section 507, uh, both in the 2015 IRC and the 2018, and, and after hearing from what Lauren was talking about in the preview to the 2021, looking forward to those. There's a lot of prescriptive measures that make it a lot easier for us to build a code compliant deck without having to get an engineer or an architect involved, which is usually cost prohibitive, especially for smaller decks. Fairfax County, Virginia has uh, their typical deck details guide. And for the most part, most of the information in there, in there is similar to what's in DCA6, but they have a couple of handy things that might be useful for builders that aren't familiar with it. Uh, one that I've relied on a couple times 
is they have a, a way to size beams for multi-span decks. In other words, if you've got joists that cantilever over a beam, that you can find in the code book of DCA6. But if you have a, two beams where you've got a middle beam and then an outer beam where you've got a cantilever, that middle beam, is going, it, you can't size that using DCA6 of the code table. So they have a, a pretty simple solution for that that's user friendly. Now, again, this isn't code, but what it is is a resource. And what I recommend to contractors is that they present this at plan review when they when they uh, draft up their plans, if they, if they do have a multi-span deck, present this to their local building official as a guide, which is well-respected. Uh, as an, uh, an alternative to having an engineer or an architect involved. And there are other details in there as well. Their table for uh, ledger fastening goes a little bit beyond what's in DCA6 and in the code, uh, particularly in regard to expansion anchors and adhesive anchors, um, where in DCA6, it'll refer you to the, I believe anyway, it'll refer us to the manufacturer's installation guide. And here, uh, it, it gives us some actual information on spacing the fasteners to attach a ledger to uh, a house where you're going to be connecting to hollow brick, or excuse me, hollow block CMU or to uh, poured concrete or grouted CMU. Um, connecting to engineered floor systems, iJoy systems, where we've got rim boards on there, um, DCA6 has one option for uh, up to a one inch. LVL, but a lot of the strand board type of rim board is used nowadays from a lot of the different manufacturers. And often it's hard to, particularly in retrofit applications, determine which iJoyce manufacturer um, uh, we're getting the product for the, the house's frame from. So rather than trying to trace that down and then go back to the manufacturer's installation guide, which of course is going to be our, our first option. Um, going to the APA's uh, performance rated rim board uh, information guide, W345. It, it's got a lot of information on rim board, but it also has a ledger fastening table, which is useful for when we get into the, the um, rim boards that aren't prescribed in DCA6 or in the code book. Um, another resource, which is actually referenced too, and I learned about it re going a little deeper into DCA6 is the Structural Building Components Association uh, attachment to, of residential deck ledger to metal plate connected wood truss floor systems. Basically open web floor trusses. Um, this gives us some options for, or, or some detailed uh, information for connecting our deck ledgers to open web floor trusses, both for the ledger attachment and for the lateral load connections. Um, both in reinforcing the trusses that we'll be um, connecting the lateral load connection to, and also for installing what they call key blocks, which will enable us to install some additional framing in the floor system to be able to install ledger to those open web floor truss systems. And then final, oh, nope, I, was, thought, it, I thought I had one more slide, I got two, product manufacturers Installation guides are um, really what we end up relying on with so much of what we do in decks today and in, in, in building in general. So many of the products we use nowadays are not explicitly described in the code book. They're proprietary products, particularly when you get into fasteners and hardware. And the only way we know how to install those products, because they're not going to be outlined in the code book and they're not going to be outlined in DCA6, is to go to those manufacturers' guides um, or and their evaluation reports, be they uh, just a regular report or an ICC ESR. Um, we need to follow those, and contractors, I see it happen all the time. They pretty much pick up a piece of hardware and they just use their best guest their best guess to install it. And we end up with all kinds of things that we see in the field, which just shouldn't be done at all. Um, and maybe some of the questions we'll get later will be related to those. But it's up to the contractor to, to uh, investigate what the proper installation of all those products are. And what I recommend to contractors all the time is when you're going to do 
a plan submission to a building department is include the installation guide. Like most uh, building officials are familiar with the common things like joist hangers. When we get into uh, specific fasteners like ledger fasteners or structural screws, they're not always familiar with the each manufacturer's individual products. And the, the installation guides for those products are not interchangeable between manufacturer. So we've got to go to the source, the, uh, the actual manufacturer's installation guide. And then lastly, uh, there are a lot of resources from uh, magazines and publications that are out there on the market. Three that I go to are, are Fine Home Building Magazine, Professional Deck Builder Magazine, and the Journal of Light Construction. And all three of those have a wealth of information on deck construction. Uh, you've got to be a little bit suspect of some of the information because it may not be, some of it might be dated, so it may not be 100% code compliant, but a lot of the construction details that we deal with aren't necessarily code related. They're more in how we say install decking. Um, and this would go above and beyond the code, but there are some good resources to make us more productive and get better finishes out of our decks when we're building them. So that's pretty much all I wanted to cover and I'll turn it back over to Laurie. Awesome, thank you, Mike. And thank you also to Matt and Lauren. And I have been watching our questions roll in from our attendees. So I wanna thank everyone for for that as well. So we had some questions that folks had submitted when uh, they registered. So I think that would be a good place to start. And I'm going to start with one for selfish reasons because people ask me this question a lot. So I'm going to ask Lauren because he's probably the most heavily involved in this. When will the next version of DCA6 come out? Will there be a 2018 version, a 2021 version? Uh, what can we expect? So I'm, I'm working on the next DCA6. I've worked on it today, in fact. So I'm hoping, hoping this year, um, we still have to get it through our committee and things like that. But that's that's kind of my hope, if my my goal wish list. One of the big things to note, though, is that DCA6, even though it's tied to like DCA6 2015, 2012, whatever it may be, that doesn't mean that it won't work for for um, future editions like the D I have no I have no knowledge of what would have changed in in between the DCA 612 and what would so though that it would make it so that it wouldn't comply with the IRC's 2021 so even though it says DCA 612 it would work perfectly fine for for them coming up and that's kind of what we're actually hoping to do with the DCA6 is make it so it's not necessarily edition based, but um, just general knowledge based. Because it's not like um, if maybe if we do have a significant change in loads or something like that. But for the most part, things are it's just we're just adding more information, not not um, having to change significant parts. Great. All right, uh, we had a, another question come in. Can this might be a good question for for Matt and for Mike, maybe from different uh, points of view. Can you talk about the landing requirements for stairs if the landing is at grade? Matt, go you ahead, want Mike. to start on that? <laughs> no, go ahead, Mike. <laughs> I've I've actually. I, I end up fielding a lot of questions from um, both contractors and building officials around the country just because they they learn, they, they just email me or what have you. And this question has come up a number of times. And um, a friend of mine who's a building official queried the ICC on this. And uh, what the feedback was is the code is silent on what that last, if, if we have to have some hard surface or something when we step down off of the last step onto the ground. However, um, when you start looking at uh, what is appropriate when you consider the stair requirements where you have to have an, an even amount of height between all of your treads, excuse me, all your risers not exceeding 
a deviation of three eighths of an inch, and you have to have a measurable slope, a maximum slope of two percent. Uh, when you look at that and you, you consider stepping from the last tread down to the earth, uh, and if you're stepping onto gravel, uh, crushed stone, or uh, lawn, then those two things kind of fall out of the equation. You can't guarantee that over time you're going to stay within that maximum deviation of three-eighths of an inch for the riser height, and you can't guarantee that you're going to have a measurable slope. Uh, usually what ends up happening is those areas end up eroding out and it becomes a trip hazard. You know, when you're walking up and down stairs, people are used to having a nice equal rise height so that their gait is, is based on that. And if you've got an unequal gait at that, I mean, excuse me, uneven uh, rise, you can step off onto something that can be dangerous if you're just stepping onto lawn. So that's pretty much my take on it. And that what we need is uh, a hard surface, be it a, a pavers, a concrete, brick, uh, and that would have to meet the the code as far as the being three feet out from the end of the last tread, the nose of the last tread, and then the width of the stairway. Uh, Lori, the only thing I would add to, to Mike's comments is he's absolutely correct. The, the code is silent on the subject. And, you know, getting to the point of installing something that meets the evenly spaced, you know, identical sized riser height within three eighths of an inch. You know, let's say we do do a concrete pad or some, you know, some pavers or some sort of other impervious surface there. Uh, as Mike indicated, you know, just associated with the step riser, that surface is going to get worn down too. So even if we do do a transition uh, piece at grade, the, the transition piece is going to be impacted by compaction and other issues. So it's just going to kind of kick it further down the road. It's it's going to be a judgment call for the code official and just to try to educate the, the homeowner and contractor about the potential for tripping hazards. We do all this work and the code does all this work for guards and handrails to avoid, you know, tripping and other injuries associated with, you know, improper framing dimensions. And this just kind of, you know, where do you stop basically? All right. Here's the question I'm seeing uh, from a handful of folks uh, kind of phrased in different ways, but it all seems to be revolving around that 200 pound minimum uh, live load requirement for a guard or a handrail. So this might be a good question for for all of you to chime in on. Um, but does, does that 200 pounds, does that need to be applied inward? Uh, I think Lauren, you had talked about, you know, that there there is a difference between a guard and a handrail. Um, but how can we determine if our if our whatever our guard handrail meets that 200 pound load requirement? And can you talk about the directionality requirements of that point load? Um, I guess this is Lauren. I'll I'll start off with with that. Uh, so it's difficult to verify that it it does meet the 200 pound point load. Um, the there are some details that like DCA6 has, the code itself does not have those details yet. Um, they have been worked, been, there has been some attempts to get them in there, but they, for various reasons, haven't haven't been in, in there. Um, often manufacturers can have, have some form of detail of how they think with their hardware or how th their hardware works to make it so it can resist that 200 pounds. Um, as far as the directionality of it, uh, in the IRC up until the 2021, it is every direction. So by code, you have to have it inwards, outwards, upwards, downwards. Um, with the 21 coming out, it's going to change that requirement. But that is limited to the IRC. With If you're doing engineering per the IBC, um, then you're going to point to ASCE split. And while I know that the Deck Code Coalition have talked with ASCE 7 and tried to get that separated, I don't think they've been successful, at least so far. Um, and so if you're doing IBC work, you're going to have outwards, downwards, all those directions too. Um, and that's, that's okay. IRC and ASCE 7 don't always perfectly align, and especially for decks. ASC 7 has a certain vertical load on on decks that the IRC does not does not reflect. 
Um, so that's that's how it currently stands now. IRC is is you don't have to do the, all the directions. ASC seven, you do. One of the right. things that uh, I can I jump in on this? Absolutely, yeah, I would okay. love it. So, so the one of the things that I, I'm curious about, Lauren, maybe you'll be able to answer it. It, it kind of um, in in that table in in chapter three where it it specifies that 200 pound load. Now, is that a load which has to be an engineer design load, or is that a constructed or or test load? Because my understanding with with most of the other loads that are on in that table, like like floor loads, for instance, of 40 pound per square foot live, all of the tables that are subsequent in the in the code book are basically they they have a safety factor added. Um, but if I'm building a deck and I'm putting a guardrail on, do I have to make sure I've uh, designed my connection to the deck frame for a guard post? Or railing to meet a, a load which would have that 200 pound load plus a safety factor, or just meet 200 pounds. So, unfortunately, it's going to depend on who you ask, <laughs> right? Okay, most engineers, I... most engineers I know are going to say yes. You act if when I do an engineering design, especially since most of these are allowable stress design, I'm going to have this safety factor in that in the IBC. It even says that you're supposed to, if you're doing a test, um, you're supposed to have a 2.5 safety factor, which bumps it up to a 500 pound load. However, the IRC doesn't specifically make a linkage to that section in the IBC. So it's not really clear. If you, if, if a attorney got in there and, and started asking questions, it could go, I could see it going either way, saying that, no, look, all the other loads are, are based on an engineer that is allowable stress, not ultimate. So they better have, they better have a factor of safety for that 200 as well. Hmm. And being an engineer, that's my take too, is, is if I have to engineer something with, so that it has a allowable stress load of 200, then um, it has a safety factor already in it, and it would be it would be really weird to have engineering make it so that you have to make things more robust than if you tested it. But that's my two bits. Thank you. <laughs> All right, great, great discussion. Um, I'm not sure who's gonna who's gonna want to take this one. You probably all could answer it, but it relates to uh, retention levels of treated lumber. So when we deal with our preservative treated lumber, obviously we have different types of retention levels when we go to Home Depot or Lowe's or wherever. Um, there's ground contact. There's above ground. What type of retention levels should we be looking at? And maybe uh, Lauren, did you wanna kick, take this one first again? Yeah, so there's there's multiple things on this and I'm sure Mike has, has even better answers than I do in a lot of areas. But by code, if it's touching ground, you've gotta have a ground, ground um, retention levels for ground contact. Now, Decks are outside structures and oftentimes get debris on them and things like that. So if I personally were doing a deck, I would have everything be ground contact or better. Um, that's me personally. The recommendations is most of the superstructure um, is is that ground ground contact. And a lot of organizations, I think TW Perry being one, have done, made it so that they only sell ground contact just as a don't have to make the people think, don't have to make them look at the little strips of paper on the end to see to see which where they're, if they're doing the right thing, because most people, they go in and they see it's a treated thing, it must be treated for everything and it's good. Um, so some, some um, organizations have have gone to completely gone ground contact and personally i think that's a that's a great way to go is just everything being ground contact as much as possible i've noticed that most of the professional lumber yards 
um, rather than the big box stores so much. Uh, the, the professional yards, at least in in the areas that I've been in the country in the Northeast, basically along the East Coast, have uh, started stocking all of their framing lumber, so two by four through two by twelves, as well as the four by and six by stock for pressure treated lumber as ground contact. Um, so it makes it a lot easier when we go into the lumber yard where we don't actually have to go and look at those little stickers at the end. Um, but I don't know if that's the case around the country. Um, the, the one thing that was I noticed a number of years ago, and I don't know exactly when it came up, is uh, the treating the American Wood Preservers Association came up with their their labeling. So it's it's not just a, a one size fits all kind of treatment. Now they have the UC4A, UC4B, UC4C. So you've got different levels, even when you get into ground contact, from like a standard to a heavy duty to an extreme duty. So you know for for contractors or building officials, if you know that your uh, decks are being built in areas where the soils are particularly biologically active, where you're going to get a lot more just critters and fungus and you know wet climates, things like that, that going to like the UC4B or UC4C treatment level, uh, which is a, a higher standard than the, just the basic. Uh, ground contact, those are going to perform better and give you a longer service life. There's also the issue too, Mike, of uh, the field treatment of cuts and notches, and that's one thing that's usually not looked at in, in depth by a lot of code officials. You know, a lot of contractors don't consider it. They, they get a piece of pressure, pressure treated lumber, it's ground contact, they notch the post for the double uh, two by beam, and of course they're, they're, you know, they're exposing the center of that wood member. Uh, you know, through the cutting and the notching. So uh, the code's pretty specific on that. That would be AWPA M4. Uh, one of the questions that we get all the time is where can we get this stuff? And maybe that, maybe that's another question. Where do we get the treatment for the for um, field treatment of field cuts and ends and notches uh, for, for decks, for decks? If, if you're on the West Coast, where if you're dealing with Western species, the incised hemp fur, and uh, then the, the, all of the, the copper naphthenate and there's uh, one other type of treatment, I think. Those are readily available in every hardware store uh, and lumber yard. But where a good part of the country where we're using southern yellow pine, it, it's like uh, the building inspectors don't check it. The the contractors are unaware of the fact that they are, they need to, to treat all those cut ends. And, and we've seen, I've got lots of pictures of those untreated cut ends uh, particularly on stairs uh, where we notch out the stringers and uh, all of those tread and riser cuts all end up rotting out after you know 10 years, eight years, something like that. And one of the problems the code has in it, and I don't know how to resolve this, is that all it tells you is that we have to treat it, field treat cuts according to M4. And then for us as a contractor to go get M4, that, how much does that cost? Like 20, 30, 40 bucks? So now I got to go buy a piece of paper to tell me what's in, in M4. Um, so it, it makes it difficult for contractors to know what they're supposed to do when, when um, the code, does, you know, kind of makes those references to standards that are proprietary like that. All right, great. Uh, this one is for Matt. Matt, you had a, a slide in your part of the uh, presentation that talked about uh, inspection, um, annual inspection of decks, and who, uh, in your opinion, or if, if the code states it as well, obviously, who would be qualified to perform such a deck inspection, an annual safety inspection type? So, based upon my opinion, which is a dangerous thing, so uh, full full disclosure there, <laughs> having worked for you know many many engineers, I would I would consider. Uh, any structural uh, engineer, uh, you know, worthy of his or her salt to be a competent person to look at a, a deck. Does that mean uh, that a reputable contractor such as Mike or, or any of the other reputable contractors out there uh, would be or would not, would be or would not be qualified? Um, you know, that's, that, that's debatable. Um, there are professional uh, inspection agencies such as uh, ASHE, the American, uh, home, American Society of uh, Home Inspectors, uh, and, and these uh, entities 
you know, have some have some training, they have some certification, just like a code official would in your lo local jurisdiction. Uh, but I guess the most important thing that I would suggest is that for for both contractors and for homeowners, you know, don't don't fear the building code department. Don't fear the building official. If, if you're there uh, looking for resources or, or education or information uh, about a critical issue issue like deck safety, don't don't hesitate to call them up uh, and get their recommendation in your jurisdiction. It's quite possible they could connect you with a you know with a list. Not that they're picking and choosing a contractor for you or anything like that, but they can possibly give you a list of resources. Uh, available that that someone that would be qualified to look at your deck uh, and to make some recommendations. We saw on the first slide, uh, uh, Frank Wiesty, Professor Wiesty, who's also a professional engineer and a PhD, um, he recommends that that, that annual uh, safety inspection. So I would have no I would have no qualms recommending uh, that inspection be performed by a licensed engineer uh, in in any person's jurisdiction. And and I would I would also add that yes, it's great to have it be done by a licensed engineer. That's gonna cost you some money. Um, contractors would be great. But if you can't afford or can't do any of those things, or if you can't afford to do have an annual engineer come out annually for your to check out on your deck, you can do it yourself, right? I mean, there's checklists, it looks like someone just put up a Nodger checklist in there. And most of it is fairly, it, whether you have a problem or not is fairly self-explanatory. We know what most people know what rotten wood looks like. Most people know what what um, completely deteriorated screws or whatever it is looks like, right? And so that can be just looking at, at it yourself could say, hey, look, I I do have a problem. I know I have a problem. I better have have someone with more expertise looked out there. The biggest problem isn't that the biggest problem with inspections isn't that they're not done by engineers, it's that they're not done at all. Very Excellent true. Point. Yeah, very true. All right, uh, this is, uh, I think this question is probably geared towards Mike, but I certainly would welcome input from all of you. Uh, for ledger board installation, if we have a house that has vinyl siding, for example, would you install the ledger board over the siding or would you need to remove some of the veneer? Uh, for Well, vinyl siding is really easy to work with. It's, it's probably the easiest siding to remove and then put back on. Um, so if I was, was going to put a ledger on a house that had vinyl siding, I'd unzip a couple of the panels above where the ledger's gonna go, do a really good flashing system. Um, we did a, a webinar that you have, uh, the AWC um, website uh, mm -hmm. from a couple of months ago there where we covered ledger flashing. And uh, so that'd be a good resource there. And then the, uh, the, the vinyl siding can be reinstalled. Um, it can be put on over. Um, there are a couple of proprietary fastening products that can be um, used that will space the ledger off the wall so the vinyl siding can continue through. Um, but you're gonna wanna make sure you incorporate your water resistant barrier that's back behind the vinyl with whatever those those brackets are. Um, and by the time you figure out the, the, the uh, extra labor involved in that, you're probably just as well to remove the vinyl side and cut the WRB back, flash it all in and then put the vinyl back on. Great. Here's a question we've seen come in from a few folks. So we talked about the guard requirement for decks that are above 30 inches in height. If we have a deck that's below 30 inches in height and we want to install a guard on that, are the requirements still the same? So maybe Matt, you want to start with that one? Yeah, I'll, I'll take a stab at this. I'll take a stab at this one, Lori. Um, and please feel free to, uh, you know, for Lauren and Mike to jump in. The, the the guidance that that I had heard from from other code officials discussing this very topic was, if you, in a lot of states, you know, mirror the building code. If there's a certain height um, that your deck structure is below 30 inches is common, 24 inches is common. The risk due to, to serious injury, injury is pretty slight at those elevations. 
Um, however, once you install a guard system, a guardrail system, uh, to prevent that accident, that accident from occurring, then whatever you touch in terms of construction associated with the deck has to be up to code. So even if your deck is, you know, let's say it's 30 inches off the ground, you really don't want to do uh, the guard system, uh, but you have, you know, if you have small children or guests or something that has small kids and you want it to be safe, so you put a railing up, then all the safety provisions, the spacing, the diameters, the four inch diameters associated with entrapment hazards, stuff like that, the outward resistance, you know, inward, outward, up and down, uh, and the graspable surfaces, uh, all those criteria would have to apply. That's, that's just my opinion, and that's what I've heard uh, and discussed and enforced in different municipalities I've worked in. Uh, once, you, once you put the guard system in, regardless of the height, then the guard system details have to be compliant with the code. So this is a question I often ask when I go out to teach, and um, it's, it's humorous to me how many different responses I get. So the, um, the correct answer is whatever your building official t says it is, is the absolute <laughs> correct Absolutely. answer, right? <laughs> if he says that it's got to be the, it's got to do that, it's got to do that. Um, so if you're doing it, um, if you're if you're in that situation, talk to your building official. It's it's going to save you a lot of headache one way or the other. And it's not like any of us on here are going to overrule your building official. All right, great. And I think this is uh, a good question. We're getting towards the top of the hour, so uh, we'll we'll wrap it up with this question. And maybe you all could s expand on this. Uh, what if you are giving advice to somebody that's out there inspecting a deck, what is the most common inspection error or the most common detail installation error? Um, where, would, where would you focus your, your time and energy making sure that a certain detail is done right, perhaps? So maybe, Lauren, would you like to start? I, I would say it's that ledger board, the connection to the ledger, and making sure that there's proper drainage and um, that the decay doesn't happen. Uh, most most things cause is the ledger board is probably the number one thing that I would say. I would agree. Um, the the flashing of the ledger. Um, when I've seen deck photos of decks that have collapsed, and I'm on one of those Google alerts, so I see them at least once every week or two, it, it looks almost always like the the ledger stays with the frame of the deck and the deck comes away from the wall. And when you see, look at the rim board of the house or the sheathing, you can see it's just rotted away. So it's not a problem with the deck failing, it's a problem with the rim joist failing because the flashing of the ledger leaked and let water in to rot that out. All right, and Matt, did you want to offer uh, any comment on this one? Um, yeah, absolutely. The, the ledger connection detail, and as Mike and Lauren indicated, the bulk water, you know, getting making sure that bulk water uh, gets out of that space and doesn't get between the pressure shield number of the house uh, and the and the deck uh, is is critical. The ledger attachment. We look at the statistics. The, the you know securing the ledger to the house is just uh, of, of critical importance. Uh, and the other thing is too is just the pet peeve from from my experience of using any possible type of screw or fastener other than a rated uh, framing framing nail or you know ring shank nail or whatever's approved in the code hot dip galvanized fastener in a in a joist hanger just from roofing nails to to drywall nails just <laughs> the the right fasteners are out there if you don't know what the right fastener is just please ask us we'll be happy to tell you. Absolutely. And with that in mind, we will provide our contact information. So thank you everyone for attending today. Thank you to Matt and Mike and Lauren 